Hey everyone, Jim T. Graham with rcgroups.com and we are in the trade show time of the year on the RC Groups online trade show, the first of its kind. And so we thought we would get some of our participants in the trade show and talk about things that you might care about. With us is Mike Mayberry with High Tech. I've known about Mike as long as I've known about the hobby. Mike, how long have you been in the hobby? Well, I've been in a hobby all my life. Um, been with high tech for uh, 23 years now. So uh, you know, I've got uh, got some good good uh, good time under my belt and really enjoy, you know, the the all aspects of the hobby, especially, uh, you know, developing products and working with the customers and and now I'm in sales and uh, I do, I do miss, uh, you know, the, the trade shows uh, not happening right now. So this is fantastic that we get to do this. Uh, and uh, congrats to you for, for, you know, and RC Groups for, for coming up with something like this. It's fantastic. It's an idea that I've had for like three years and never pursued it because I was always going to the next one, you know, first you're at Toledo, then you're at uh, Joe Nall. And so this year, it actually, there was a window to make it happen. I saw a memory come across this morning, and it was Norm doing the uh, whiskey bottle trick where he drops a match in and it whistles to the ceiling. Have you ever <laughs> seen that at the bar in Toledo? I don't remember that one, no. Uh, maybe I'll share it today then. Well, today <laughs> we're here to, yeah, here, today we're going to talk about uh, high tech and you know, as we may or may not know, most of us do know that high tech sells servos. And so Mike was going to elaborate on some servo information that you might need to know about in 2020. So we're going to start out with, Mike, the difference between analog versus digital. Well, that's a good question. So, you know, people want to know, one of the first things they'll ask is that, can you intermix analog and digital? And, you know, the answer was yes, you can use any type of servo, analog, um, digital, you know, with a receiver all at one time. Um, you want to make sure that you don't have like one aileron have analog and the other have digital. You want to, you know, have the surfaces that, you know, match up. So you could have ailerons be analog and your tail surfaces be digital. Um, the difference is, is the way that the, uh, the signal is sent to the motor. Um, the advantage to a digital servo is that it has uh, much more holding torque and it develops its torque much sooner. Uh, it's so, so when you push against it, it's, it's very stiff. It's hard to defeat where if you push against an analog servo, you can, you can defeat it. You can kind of push against it. And so as that, um, as the servo starts to move, the digital servo is going to push through much quicker. Uh, it's also going to center better. Um, and then typically have, have more, you know, more power. But, um, another question is how, um, much does it drain the battery? Let me, you know, let, me it, let me stop you on that topic. What if I put an analog in one side of a wing and a digital in the other side? Yeah, that's what I was saying. Is you don't you don't want to have them be on the same surface. Okay. Um. So or the same. You know, you wouldn't want an analog servo on your right aileron, a digital servo on your left aileron. It's not that it wouldn't work. It's not that the plane wouldn't fly. Um. But the the one servo is going to perform a little bit different than the other. Um, so you want to match up the servos, uh, to make sure that you're using, you know, if you had two elevator servos, one on each half, those were both either analog or digital, but not one on each half. Is there a time when using analog is better than using digital or is digital always better? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so analog servos, um, I would say that it's more of a, maybe a cost factor. Um, you know, but I would take a digital servo over an analog servo every day because the centering is better, comes back to a tighter, uh, dead band. Uh, so the analog servos have about an eight millisecond dead band where the digital servos have a uh, one to two millisecond dead band. And that's, and that means that it's just the area that the, uh, that the servo returns to. So it's going to be more accurate. And... So does that address what servo to use and why? Well, um, there's a lot of getting into, you know, what servo do you use and how do you know what, what you need? Um, one of the things that I tell people is that there is no such thing as too much torque. It's like too much money, too much fun. There's just no such thing. So um, anytime you have a servo that 
uh, an application where they say, oh, you need 100 inch ounces of torque, um, then you look at that as almost like a minimum and of like a computer system, right? When it says you need to have this, uh, this computer to run this game. Well, it always runs better with a better computer. It, same thing happens with the servos, is that if it says 100 inch ounces of torque um, and you throw uh, 100 inch ounces in there, um, it means you're working that servo close to its capacity. So you really want to have headroom. You want to make sure that, you know, if a servo, then you throw in a servo has 200 inch ounces of torque, it's like the servo's taking a walk in the park versus, you know, running, st sprinting down the, right, you know, right down the track. So um, you always want to take that as a grain of salt as those are the minimum, the minimum things. Um, but um, one of the big things that, that people, you know, want to know is that, you know, how, how do I know which servo to use? Um, so always look at the torque rating that the manufacturer suggests and make sure you're above that. Um, also look at the level of servo versus the level of model that you're putting it in. Um, you know, if you put a lot of hard work and effort and money, blood, sweat, and tears okay. into a model, you don't want to skimp on a servo. Um, I, I kind of refer to it, you know, as in fishing terms, like, you know, don't put the cheap line on there if you, in, because when you go and hook that big one and it breaks, you're going to be like, why did I put the cheap line on there? Same thing with a servo. It's not that the, the lower cost servos are, you know, um, inferior in, in that, the, you know, they're most likely work, but, but you want to put the best, you know, product to match up the, the level. So if you're flying a jet, for example, you're going to want to use a brushless or a coreless motor servo. Um, but if you're flying a little sport model that, uh, you know, is, you didn't put a lot of time and effort and money into, then, you know, you want to keep the cost down. You could use a, you know, a 425 servo or something like that, a basic servo, as long as it meets the torque standards. In my early days of building, I would have a handful of servos and let's say a profile plane. And so it got down to the theory of, of me deciding what's the best servo in this pile and where should it go? And I always went, I, I always thought, what's the most important surface on this airplane? And I always thought it was the elevator. The, you're not doing much without an elevator. That's right, for sure. Right. I so could maybe it, lose one aileron. I could lose the rudder, but you can't lose the elevator. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that that I would say that you're absolutely correct. That that is the most important spot, um, you know. And um, it's interesting too is that some people think that the throttle is not so important. Um, and on these big giant scale airplanes, for example, they'll wow. put a super cheap throttle servo in there. Well, you can get yourself in trouble losing a throttle servo. Yeah. And uh, so, so I always recommend that, that you stick with the big giant scale planes that you just, when you're buying servos for your, for the surfaces, buy one of the same servos for the, for the throttle, because it's that, again, that same level of component. Insurance. You've got a, a nice expensive model. You put a lot of time and effort into you want to put the, the best quality, you know, product you can, you know, in every, every part of it. Here's a question I should know the answer to, but I am talking to the person who does know the answer. So I'm going to ask it in the early days. If I were to bump a surface on one of my planes, I could potentially strip the servo. But lately, the last few years, I have bumped, moved, adjusted surfaces and never stripped a servo. Is it because the components are made differently or better, or is there, is it, can I still break a servo by bumping the surface? Well, the, the gear trains now you have a, there's, we offer three different gear trains. Um, we offer a nylon gears, which are in the lower, you know, lower cost, smaller servos typically. Um, we also offer a, a gear train called carbonite and carbonite is uh, again what uh, Han Solo was frozen in, but um, we know that uh, that that it's actually a, a kind of a glass-filled nylon is the uh, uh, material that we use. So so it's about four times stronger than the than the regular nylon. Um, so those are sturdier, um, but they're still many times weaker than metal. And metal gears are, is is the most the, the strongest. Um, we have standard metals, a combination of aluminum, brass, and steel. Uh, we also have steel all steel and we also have titanium and those are the strongest gears uh, 
the very, very first gear that touches the, the motor pinion is um, typically nylon in the past. And one of the reasons for that is that um, you need to have the buffer of the metal to metal contact with the motor or you would get some jittering. So what Hitech developed um, several years ago is what we call an MP gear, which is a metal um, plastic. So the inner pinion that touches the, the main gear train is metal. And then the outer um, spur gear that touches the pinion gear of the motor is plastic. And so that gives us that buffer zone, but it also makes that gear much, much stronger. Um, and to further that in the very, very high powered servos, we actually run a ring of aluminum around the outer portion of that spur gear. Hmm. So that strengthens it even further, but still gives us that buffer zone. So in our brushless servos and our high-end models, um, that has that really unique um, gear at that very first gear. So it makes them very, very strong. So that makes me think of this, and I only bring it up in case it happens to someone new. Um, you know, when I'm running a 3D model with huge surfaces and the best servos I can buy, I started running into an issue where I would put in a new pack and everything would just jitter. And I literally wouldn't, the first time this happened to me, I wouldn't fly the airplane. And um, my conclusion was that it was the hot pack Make it, because as soon as I put one fly or uh, got a little juice off that, that fresh lipo, it stopped jittering. Is this a known thing? There's, um, it, it can be, um, we, you know, and it was just, you know, with all brands, but, but with the high tech servos, um, in the past, uh, with our 7,000 series servos, we have what was called a slight load jitter. Um, and so as they're like the weight of the control surface and especially with a big 3d model, right? You've got this giant aileron or giant like, elevator like this big yeah, on some of them. Exactly. So just the weight of that of that surface sitting on the ground um, Would create a little a little bit of jitter um, if you went up and touched the surface um, it would go away or when you fly the model and the, the flight loads equalize over the surface then that would go away um, but what we've done with our, our latest servos, which are the D-series servos, um, we have a smart sense function. And what the smart sense does is it's kind of like an auto gain function. And it senses those types of loads and, and sets the servos um, hysteresis to be its most effective and eliminate that, that little bit of jitter. So with that said, we're going to jump over to the high tech site. This is hightechrcd.com. Tell me what the RCD stands for. Um, well, uh, when I tell people on the phone, I say it's Romeo Charlie Delta so that they will remember it, you know, but uh, RCD is a uh, radio control development and it was a separate company back uh, in the late eighties, early nineties that was making receivers for um, you know, the aftermarket when the, the 1991 gold regulations came out. So that was one of the big things that RCD was doing. And then um, it was a little before my time, but uh, they, uh, they uh, you know, um, basically joined forces with, with high tech. So um, we've always kept that name. And so from here, we jump over to the D series page. Yeah. And this is your D series servo. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of the of the servos that you're familiar with in the past that were maybe a 5000 or 7000 series that are now a D series. Um, so the D series, uh, what's what's really nice, again, I'd mentioned about that auto gain function that eliminates the jittering, um, but it also has much higher resolution. So resolution is the uh, how many steps that the that the movement of the servo and it does it does relate to to the resolution of your transmitter but the these have 4096 resolution so there's 4096 steps in a full 90 degree movement so it makes them much much smoother awesome one of the other features is the um soft start and that means that when you first turn the power to the servo um, in the past, you know, like with the giant scale planes, the, the weight of the surface, those, they were kind of 
drop down, you know, maybe the ailerons were, were sagging all the way wow. down and you turn your plane on and it zips back to the, to that center point. Um, well, that puts load on the gear train and, and uh, the motors and stuff like that. So when you first power up now, um, the servos will come slowly back to the center. And once they're, once they're initial, initialized there, then they would just be, um, they would work as, as normal. That's so that's kind cool. of a neat feature. Um, all the high-tech servos, uh, digital servos are programmable. Um, we do have what's called a DPC-11, which is a uh, PC-based programmer. Uh, it's about $20. Uh, and then the HFP-30, which is a nice handheld unit that you can use uh, at, the, uh, at the field um, or in your garage. Um, one of the things with the, the giant scale planes is that you're typically using more than one um, servo per control surface. So you need to kind of match the servos um, to make sure that they're not fighting each other. And on this, uh, that HFP 30 that you see there, there's a sync feature. So you would plug uh, your main servo in and get it all, all powered up. And then uh, you'd plug the, the second or even third servo in and you can sync them to each other so that they're wow. not gonna fight each other. So that's made that, that type of thing, that matching servos, um, be much better. Very nice. Now, while we're here on the site, I did want to ask about this wing, the Zenofex. So I have friends that are farmers here in Tennessee, and yeah. I actually have been looking at uh, uh, things that you could fly over a crop and analyze all the different things. And I know that these cameras that, well, tell us about this before I. So this is, um, this is our, our, uh, our, our fixed wing mapping drone. Um, the way it works is it's based off a, a, a multiplex model, uh, the Xeno, uh, which we had uh, for several years uh, and it's very efficient. And the way it works is that we have a tablet that has uh, this mapping software on it. And what you do is you go on, it's like Google Earth, and you lay out and you draw a line back and forth with a map of how you want to have this fly. And so, um, and what's kind of cool is that when you, uh, you launch it, the motor doesn't start until you chuck it. So once you chuck it, uh, the motor will start and it will fly this path that you've told it and it will map um, everything. And then once it maps all that, it stitches everything all together and allows you to, uh, to monitor a lot of different things. And especially for, you know, for farmers that want to, you know, keep an eye on, on their, their herds or their crops or whatever, and see what's going on, look for patches or look for, <laughs> look for lost animals. You know, uh, there's a lot, lot of things that, that you can do with it. And this is just one of the, the drones that, that we offer. Um, and uh, this is part of, uh, of High Tech Commercial Solutions, which is actually uh, a division that was kind of split off um, with, uh, with High Tech RC. And it's showing here, um, you know, how, how the, uh, it's just, it's basically a small little tablet and you just draw, draw your lines on it and it flies the course and then comes and lands back wherever you tell it to land. Um, tell me about the camera payload. So do you pick the camera that you want? Does it come with a the camera? There's options. So what you can do is, I mean, there's, there's everything from a camera to, uh, to, I think LIDAR even. Um, so there's a lot of different options, uh, that you would select, uh, and you know, you choose the platform that you're looking for and you know, uh, it, uh, it just varies from there with what you're looking to do. Interesting. I know the Sequoia is a good unit at probably one of the best prices on the market that can tell a farmer multiple things about their crops. Very interesting. I think it's awesome that you guys are in this field because I think a lot of this is the future. Of what we're oh doing. yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, it's something, and this is another, another one we have is the endurance um and then there's a trinity which is actually a, like a vertical takeoff uh transition into forward flight really? uh, so there's uh we have multiple different models very cool 
Is there anything that we need to look at on the site while we're here? Look at on the site. Well, um, like you know, the planes. Or... What's that? Like, um, so just so you know, uh, if you're listening to the broadcast right now, we're scheduled to do two more live broadcasts with high tech during the trade show. And in one of the trade shows, we're going to talk about chargers. Mike, tell us what you're going to discuss in our charger broadcast. Well, you know, chargers, uh, we, we've been making chargers for, for a while now. We're very trusted. Uh, the products have just gotten better and better and easier to use. But it's still, you know, there's still a learning curve, obviously, on anything that, that you have. And, and people don't always understand exactly what they need to do with charging. So uh, my goal would be to, if we could have an interactive session, to, you know, answer people's questions if, they, if they're, you know, unsure. How do you know what, what charger, what charging rates? Um, you know, what to look for. Um, there's kind of some misconceptions about, about charging and, and understanding about, you know, what, how you want to do it and how to go about it. So uh, we talk about some of the features of the chargers and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I'd be really happy to help people understand a little bit more about what's, what's all involved and, and what settings they need to use and, and at least be more familiar with the product. And then you can look forward to another live broadcast where we're going to talk about flat foamies. It's interesting that this is a, let me uh, split scenes here, a new craze because we both know that flat foamies are where the whole electric uh, RC concept came from in like 2000 and something, 2003, I guess, or so. Yeah. Uh, so flat foamies are back. So we're going to talk about that and some other announcements that you have. Yeah, yeah. So the Multiplex uh, has built a, a line of the, the flat foamies made out of the EPP material, which is very, very durable, um, supported by carbon fiber to make them sturdy. Uh, they've kind of started with a, with a basic extra 330. Uh, you know, we have the power pack for that and two cell lipo and, you know, very lightweight. Uh, then there was a biplane, uh, the Challenger, uh, and it's got some notoriety lately with an article in the AMA magazine. Uh, people may have seen that. Um, there's a lot of videos out there. Uh, one of the really cool new planes that, that we came out with is called the Funny Cub. And if people are familiar with Multiplex, they've heard of the Fun Cub, obviously. Um, so the Funny Cub is a little flat foamy that, that is a, a cub and that it, it, um, it, is has the big wheels and you can set it up with there it is you can set it up with uh flapper um and you know it's it's not a precision plane it's a fun plane and and uh so it's that same type of flying i mean of course you can hover it and you know stuff like that and do all sorts of stunts uh and and it's very durable so if it does uh if you do stuff it into the ground um yeah, our, our, it would be available through Weekend or Warehouse. We should have that available probably by the time we see this. Um, so with everything going on, we've, we've uh, taken that down. But uh... uh -oh. Let's, you know, put the high-tech servos in there with them too. Awesome. So here's a little video. Showing some indoor flying. Yep, that's the Challenger. And this is one of the best ever uh, of these type of models as far as performance goes. Uh, biplanes are always, you know, fantastic because of how much wing area they have. So they right. fly so slow and fly so easily. And of course, these can just do every possible stunt, you know, imaginable. So if you're looking to uh, to, you know, learn, learn 3d, um, or, you know, even anybody. I mean, this is, this is one of those things where you can fly it any way you want to, you can fly it around, you can put it around, you can do every stunt in the book. Um, it, uh, it makes you look good too. So, so if you've, if you've never, you know, been real confident with flying 3d, these are the, definitely the planes to get. Where's this at? Where's this shot? That was in Germany. So that's, uh, that was multiplex, uh, going to a big event in, in Germany. And, uh, 
just showing off the product. So we have the uh, the Funny Cub, the Challenger. There's two colors of the extra 300, and then a new um, Slick 360. All right. Well, we'll talk more, I guess, about that in our future live broadcast. And then now, are there some uh, new releases that we need to discuss? Or is it too soon to talk about anything new? <laughs> well, actually, I what I want to talk about is something old. Um, so the 7955 and the 7950 were two of our mainstay servos for many, many years. And with the development of the D-series circuit, um, they were replaced. They were replaced with the D955 and the D950. So you can see that the names are similar, except with a D instead of a seven. Uh, and that added those functionalities that I talked about with the soft start and the higher resolution. Um, also the D-series has a 25 tooth spline and a three millimeter screw, so a little more standardized. Um, but there was you know, so much love for the 7955 and the 7950 that and people still asking about it and said, well, I would, I would just, I just would rather use that. You know, I'm just so familiar with it. Um, so what we decided to do was bring those two servos back. Huh. So it's kind of like back by popular demand. Um, they will be available here in the near future, um, and it's actually a little bit better price point than they were before. So the uh, 7955 will be at 92.99, and the 7950 will be at 102.99. So real good pricing on those uh, servos that people are very familiar with. So those will be back available here shortly. Awesome, and we're shooting this video ahead of time, so I should have that information up when you're watching the video. Great. So Mike, I believe we've covered all our topics for today. Uh, if you wanna visit High Tech, go to hightechrcd.com. Are you still the guy that they get if they have a question on the telephone? Um, sometimes, yeah. So our service department uh, handles most of the incoming calls, Tony uh, and Don. Um, but they can certainly get to me as needed and, and uh, I'm happy to help anytime. The first time or the first thing complicated in the hobby I ever wanted to do was figure out how to put crow on an airplane. And that is the first time I ever spoke to you. And that was way back when I first started working for Hobby Lobby. Yeah, I remember. That goes way back. So and way back. it's interesting because I'm still the same person. I still want to do all the weirdest things I can to my uh, radio programming, even though I realize now that I almost never will use it. But I guess it's just the point of, of uh, seeing if you can do it. It's always good to have it in there. All right, man. Well, I appreciate taking you taking time to talk to us and we look forward to talking to you next week with some more live chats. Uh, is there anything you want to leave us with? You know, uh, it's a crazy time right now, and and uh, I just want everybody to be safe, and uh, you know, we'll all uh, I'll get through this, and and you know, make it out on the other side. So let's keep playing with our toys, uh, and have fun, and uh, just you know, let's uh, let's do the right thing, and and everybody be good. Well, big thanks to High Tech and everybody on the team, and you have been on RCGroups.com.